Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi. More state residents will soon be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccination. Governor Murphy today expanded the pool to those 55 and older starting April 5th, along with anyone over the age of 16 with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The next tier of essential workers will also be included. That's higher education teachers and staff, public utility, communication support, and sanitation workers among the larger list. The announcement comes even as residents continue struggling to get a vaccine appointment. Across the state, though, nearly 3.8 million doses have been given and more than 1.3 million people are now fully vaccinated. The state has hundreds of locations administering the shots, but says it needs the supply to keep up with demand. Today, unveiling a new community vaccination center in Newark at NJIT, it opens Monday through a partnership with FEMA. It'll deliver 6,000 doses a day, seven days a week, all part of an effort to increase vaccine equity in communities of color hit hardest by the pandemic. And Governor Murphy says May 1st is the target date to open eligibility to essentially the entire adult population. That's everybody age 16 and over. It's a race against the highly contagious variants spreading here. New Jersey is still number one in the nation for new COVID-19 cases per capita. Today reporting the highest number of new positive infections since January, with more than 4,000 in a single day and another 28 lives lost. Hospitalizations also remain at their highest level since February. Health leaders are still trying to figure out how to combat new infections where rapid spread is likely. This week, Rutgers University took a bold step, becoming the first college in the nation to require COVID vaccines for all students who want to return to campus classes and dorms in the fall. We'll Will other New Jersey colleges be next? Lay Mishkin has our story. Being here for the past three years, having so many people on campus, and then suddenly it just being empty has definitely been difficult. No um, matter which grade, most Rutgers students agree the college experience hasn't been what they once knew or expected because of the pandemic. I miss my friends. I miss being able to, you know, just call them on a random Sunday and want to study with them and get together in larger groups. They deserve the college experience. So how does Rutgers plan to bring back that experience? By requiring all 71,000 students to get vaccinated in order to register for classes. Rutgers University Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Antonio Calcado said there are a few exemptions. The typical ones being medical or uh, religious exemptions. Also, if you are on a uh, full online degree granting program, you're exempted or some instances within our continuing education programs, which typically are things like um, CEU credits online or, uh, or off campus. What we're requiring is much like the other immunizations that students are now required to get, whether it's rubella or TB. If you simply choose not to be vaccinated, no, you will not be allowed to enroll at Rutgers University for the fall. We've come out with this as early as we could. I definitely understand how it's controversial. You know, I understand that not everybody wants to get the vaccine and some people definitely have hesitations or reasons that they can't get the vaccine. But I do think that it's probably the best course of action. Do you think it's feasible to get everyone vaccinated by that time frame? The president, Biden, spoke of uh, having at least one shot into every eligible adult by May 31st. And, and then when he spoke about asking states to, um, to literally open it up to all adults by May 1st, we thought this is where we have an opportunity 
to be able to uh, get our population in. Rutgers University was approved by the state to be a vaccine site. Calcato anticipates having centers up and running on their campuses in Newark, New Brunswick and Camden in May. He says that will eliminate any potential accessibility barriers. I support it uh, wholeheartedly. Um, because it's such a dangerous virus, I feel like a vaccine in this case would be, should be a mandatory thing. What if students aren't 18 or older? Calcato says students will have access to the Pfizer vaccine, which is 16 and up. Epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera hopes other universities follow suit. So right now, what we know is that adults age 20 to about 49 are the ones who have had and consistently had the highest reproduction or transmission rates. So it certainly makes sense um, for to have the students vaccinated, particularly if they're living in a communal living setting. The vaccine is not mandatory for faculty and staff, but the school will offer it to anyone eligible in the community at their sites. Having all of the students who are in a classroom will certainly reduce the likelihood um, that the virus will spread to the faculty. Um, I don't think that just having the students will be sufficient. Um, so we want the faculty to be vaccinated as well. Antonio Calcato says they're trying to create the safest campus in America and the vaccine is their strongest tool. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Well, the nation is also facing a crisis at the border. It's not a new problem, but one that's persisted under both Democrat and Republican presidents alike. Yet the situation is different now, in part because of the pandemic. Here at home, immigration advocates have been pushing to expand both protections and resources for undocumented residents. As controversy grows over lucrative federal contracts enabling county prisons to house detainees, Joanna Gagas reports on the struggles inside New Jersey's immigrant communities. Jorge and I were happily married before he was arrested. He has just started his painting uh, company and it was going well. We love our daughter, Rachel, and we were looking forward to welcoming a new baby into our family. Jorge Chajon was an undocumented immigrant who came to the U.S. alone at the age of 13 and was given DACA status under President Obama. But after marrying Sharon, a U.S. citizen, he decided to apply for a green card. But because a mistake was made on Jorge's application, immigration authorities denied his green card. We filed then for an appeal, but again, it was denied. And just within a week, he was detained. Arrested in front of his home as he was getting ready for work. It's a story familiar to many immigrant families in New Jersey. New Jersey has been the so-called detention hub. For the region. There are currently 371 ICE detainees in New Jersey, ICE being the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Out of the four centers that house them, nearly 200 are in Essex County alone. The New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice has launched a campaign called Fair and Welcoming New Jersey for All that seeks protections for those in the immigrant community by removing the words like alien and implementing systems to make our schools safer, make hospitals safer, make courthouses and make the data that state agencies gather more secure. People should feel comfortable to seek these services and just by nature of going to these places, they should not be cooperating with federal law uh, federal immigration enforcement. They're also supporting a bill that would eliminate new and some existing ICE contracts with state detention centers. It does affect two out of the four immigration detention agreements. It does not eliminate immigration detention entirely in New Jersey, um, simply because some contract does not, don't have expiration date. And we also need to question, is it legal? or is it reasonable to have any contract that has no expiration date? Wong says it's a numbers game. New Jersey houses detainees cheaper than New York, so ICE comes here. And the counties profit from the partnership, although revenues have dropped as the number of detainees has fallen from the thousands to the hundreds over the years. But Chahon says the conditions for her husband in Essex County were deplorable, something Essex County Executive Joe DiVincenzo denies. You know, it's better than to be here okay than to be out in Pennsylvania where there never would be a good chance to see their families. And if the county lost the contract, you would uh, need to pick up a revenue source. And if we don't pick up that revenue source, there's going to be people that are going to be laid off. 
uh, and taxes are going to be increased. We should not be making profit from incarcerating people. The alternative would be to fight their case outside of detention. Jorge Chajon eventually won his immigration case, but not before he lost his business and their family's home because he couldn't work during the 16 months he was detained waiting for a court date. Our nightmare was a complete waste of time and money and causes a lot of suffering. The bill has yet to get a vote, but ICE is currently seeking information on a new facility to open in the state, something advocates say could devastate hundreds more families. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. In the wake of two mass shootings which killed 18 people, local and federal leaders are coming together, calling on Congress to address the issue of gun violence. Today, Senators Menendez and Booker held a press conference in Newark's Branchbrook Park, urging their colleagues to take action on gun law reform. Even before the shootings, Democrats in Washington were advancing stricter gun control measures, but the proposals remain splintered along the party lines that have delayed movement for decades. Despite New Jersey's tough stance on guns, today Senator Booker said they find their way onto our streets, vowing to renew efforts in the policy overhaul. New Jersey has the third lowest incidence of gun violence in America. The state's doing their job. But when you still have hundreds of New Jerseyans murdered every single year, Thousands wounded, suicides, domestic violence. We should be ashamed of ourselves because this is not an inevitable destiny. It is a policy choice. This week, the state also released preliminary data on bias incidents for 2020. At more than 1,400, it's New Jersey's highest annual total ever, with stark increases targeting BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. Releasing more data like this is part of the strategy to prevent incidents and better educate the public. Our senior correspondent David Cruz spoke with Attorney General Grabir Graywall about that plan as part of Reporters' Roundtable this week. The other big story, the shooting in Georgia, uh, six of the eight people killed of Asian descent. It was really just a stark example of what many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have been seeing over the past year. The, uh, the state just released these statistics that really put it in dramatic perspective. An 82% increase in bias incidents against Asians and Pacific Islanders. COVID is uh, obviously driving that. What's the plan uh, of attack on this fight? Yeah, we have a, listen, a hate problem in this country and New Jersey is not immune from it. We have seen the escalation, not just between 2019 and 2020, we've seen it on the increase over the last four or five years. We know why it's happening. We know what the causes are. And we had a former president that normalized hate, his enablers normalized hate with social media platforms that let them spread this, these hateful messages without any restrictions whatsoever. And that brought uh, these, these terrorist, domestic terrorist organizations out of the woodwork. Uh, and that led to a proliferation of, of hate in this country. We saw it in Georgia. We've been ringing the alarm uh, for years. In 2018, I gave a speech uh, in Washington, D.C., to an Asian American Pacific Islanders conference saying that we need to be mindful of our rhetoric because we were seeing the president's anti-immigrant rhetoric giving rise to attacks on uh, brown people like me. Uh, uh, an Indian engineer in Kansas was killed because he was being told to go back to his country. So is there any surprise when the president and his former president and his enablers were talking about the Kung flu and the Chinese virus that that, that there was going to be an uptick in these types of, of hate crimes. We have a playbook in New Jersey once again here too. The, the governor put together a youth bias task force in 2019 when we saw this rising and we're focused on education for our young people, anti-bias education, stricter enforcement and better data sharing. I'm going to now start releasing data on bias offenses on a monthly basis because I don't have the luxury, we don't have the luxury to wait an entire year to let 2020 go by and release numbers now and look back and see what happened and try to think about solutions. What is the status of the state's courts system? When are we going to see that reopen? Yeah, you know, I know the Administrative Office of Courts, uh, the Chief Justice, Judge Grant, are, are bringing back uh, some uh, 
uh, you know, s some folks now, and there's a, a plan in place to, to start that up again. Uh, you know, we've been doing virtual grand juries at the state level to keep things moving uh, and to make sure people uh, are not being held, you know, pending trial for, for extraordinary period of, of time, but there are no trials. So we're trying to move other aspects of the criminal justice process. I know the Administrative Office of Courts has plans in place to bring folks back because we need to start moving things uh, in the interest of justice right now. You can watch the full conversation with David on Reporters Roundtable this Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on NJPBS, along with Chatbox that airs right after at 6.30 p.m. Saturday and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Well, the legislative cleanup continues on legal marijuana. Today, Governor Murphy signed a bill tweaking the measure so police are required to notify parents when their teens are caught with alcohol and weed. Families and law enforcement were outraged over the initial rule preventing their involvement for those under the age of 18. Some lawmakers say the changes need to go a step further. Republican senators introduced a bill to adjust the violations officers would now face for detaining a minor or illegally searching them, proposing that police only face a criminal charge of civil rights deprivation if they target a person for their race, religion, gender, sexuality, or ethnicity. The whole process of legalizing marijuana has been so challenging because advocates want to make sure it addresses racial and social justice issues. Numerous studies show white people use drugs at similar rates as black residents, but blacks make up nearly 75 percent of those in jail for drug possession. Some advocates say the only way to end the so-called war on drugs is to decriminalize all of them in small amounts and do away with a policy they say is rooted in racism harming communities of color. Reverend Dr. Charles Boyer is pastor of Bethel AME Church in Woodbury and member of a grassroots coalition called Abolish the Drug War. He sees the political will on legal weed as an opening for the concept. Reverend Boyer, uh, first of all, thanks for your time today. You know, when we talk about this issue, a lot of folks think of it as radical, but you say it's really about morals. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we are at a, a Kairos moment, a very potent time in our, in our state, in our country, where folks are revisioning, reimagining, and re-understanding what compassion, what health, uh, what morality, uh, and what justice looks like. And so um, uh, this, this really isn't about uh, being radical in the sense that people traditionally think about it, but it is about radical love. It is about radical grace, radical mercy, and ultimately radically doing what's right. You've seen what it's taken to get legalized marijuana on the books. This would undoubtedly be even more difficult. And you've got people who are concerned uh, saying, you know, it could open the door um, for negative consequences. What do you say to that? There's always potential for unintended consequences. But what we do know is what we have been doing has not worked. This June, this July, we will be celebrating 50 years of Nixon's declaration of the drug war. A drug war which has been rooted, which was rooted in racism by their own admission. And so what we can't do is continue to perpetuate a deeply structurally racist system. What we can't do is continue to break families apart, to hurt people, to demonize people. That's what we can't do. In your mind or in an ideal situation, what would this decriminalization look like? How would it play out in the communities that you work with? Ultimately, communities must be involved in determining what that what these kind of alternative responses would be. We need alternative responses rather than police when it comes down to substance use situations. We need um, non-coercive treatment options. We need safe places where folks who use drugs can go because the data shows that like in Portugal, when those kind of spaces are there, use actually comes down because people are not afraid to access services because the environment is non-punitive. We have to make larger investments in our public health system and in our mental health system so that many of the folks who are self-medicating because they have very little options because of health care or because of the, the very limited access to mental health care, that these different things would be in place, that we would build up a compassionate health response 
and begin to dismantle the criminal justice response. Reverend Boyer, good to talk to you. Thanks for your time today. Same here. Thank you. This week, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said he's committed to getting the long-stalled Gateway Tunnel project back on track, starting with completing an environmental impact study that's delayed the project. He says it'll be done by June. He told the House Transportation Committee it's a regional issue with national significance, echoing what transportation advocates and elected officials have said for years. If the tunnels fail, the entire U.S. economy would feel it. The project would build a new rail tunnel under the Hudson River to allow existing tubes to be closed for repair of damage caused nearly a decade ago by Superstorm Sandy. Former President Donald Trump opposed the project, including some sources of funding for the tunnel. Now a quick check on how Wall Street rounded out the trading week. Support for the Business Report provided by IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. This weekend, join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat. She takes a look at what's ahead for the transportation industry, including New Jersey Transit's budget, the push for electric cars, and how our cities are getting more pedestrian and bike friendly. What does it mean for your town? Watch it on NJPBS Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Tonight, we bring you part two of a candidate conversation looking at one of the most hotly contested primary races this election cycle between two former running mates and friends in Bergen County's 37th Legislative District. Democratic Assembly members Gordon Johnson and Valerie Vanieri Huddle are both vying for the longtime seat of retiring Senator Loretta Weinberg. Gordon has the backing of the party. Huddle wants an open primary. The battle is sparking division among the party. Our chief political correspondent Michael Aaron goes on the record with Assemblyman Gordon Johnson. Johnson. Assemblyman Gordon Johnson is locked in a tough primary fight with his longtime running mate, Assemblywoman Valerie Huddle, to succeed Loretta Weinberg in the state Senate. Why, why should voters of the 37th District vote for you over Valerie Huddle? Uh, I, well, number one, uh, my whole life has been dedicated uh, to community service, to service to the people I, I, I uh, represent either as a police officer in the city of Inglewood for 24 year, years, or as a Bergen County Sheriff for, uh, in the Sheriff's Department for six years, or as a, a state legislator for 18 years, my whole life. And also, and also a member of the military where I was I mobilized twice. So that, and that was service to country. So my whole life has been towards public service. And also I, I feel that uh, one has to go out and be with the people you represent. You're saying that you've been more out in the community than Valerie Huddle? I have been out there working and walking with, with the people uh, during the process, as you know, the process to, uh, to get the county line, one has to go out and collect signatures from the county committee people from uh, 13 towns. I went out to 12 or 13, talking to the county committee people, uh, talking to the people there and collecting signatures. And that's how I operate. I want to be with them. You know, when I've been covering politics for a long time, there's very often a red herring thrown into a political race, something out of left field. It happened in your race about 10 days ago when somebody uh, planted with Politico a story about you uh, making a woman who would come to see you, a woman from local politics, making her feel uncomfortable by sexually suggestive remarks. What was your response when you read that story? Yeah, uh, this uh, came out, like, uh, well, she says it happened 13 years ago. I do not remember the incident itself. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Paul, Dr. Deutra Paul, and I will not, uh, I will not disparage, disparage her. So, uh, and I've reached out to her. Valerie Huddle says that you're the candidate of the bosses. You have the endorsement of the Bergen County Democratic Organization, uh, of Governor Murphy, of S Senator Weinberg. Uh, to Valerie, that makes you the candidate of the bosses. What do you say to that? Well, uh, I, uh, I have a lot of respect for Senator Loretta Weinberg. She's been my mentor for the past 18 years in this position. And uh, if, she, if Valerie wants to call her a boss, that's, that's her decision. But uh, 
Uh, I, I, I followed the mentoring of Senator Loretta Weinberg for years. You've been running MACE with Valerie Huddle for 16 years. You've been in the legislature for 20 years. How awkward is it to suddenly be at war with someone you were allied with for so long? Well, you know, that's it's just part of this democratic process. And everyone knew that one day uh, Loretta Weinberg, Senator Weinberg, would be de departing, would be leaving. So uh, I feel that I am the correct person to for this position in the state Senate. And apparently Valerie does, too. So we'll see, uh, you know, how, how it plays out. But uh, that's just part of the democratic process. All right. Assemblyman Gordon Johnson, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Finally, a collaboration built nearly 3,000 miles apart. Newark's Mayor Raz Baraka is teaming up with the mayor of Los Angeles to help cities grappling with the increase of violence spurred by the pandemic. Together with community safety experts, they're launching the nation's first ever association of community-based violence prevention and public safety programs. The CBPSA will include leaders and organizations from major U.S. cities and help build support and funding to reimagine public safety so it doesn't rely on but complements policing and begins to reform the criminal justice system on a national scale. The mayor say it's all about understanding violence as a public health issue. And that does it for us this week, but head over to njspotlightnews.org or find us on social to continue following our reporting all weekend long. And a joyous Passover to all those celebrating this weekend. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for watching. Have a beautiful weekend. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.